Today's fun and festivities is about chain hoist, and we're talking about operational issues with chain hoist. We are not going to be talking very much at all about, um, you know, the mechanics, the, the nuts and bolts of, uh, of, of chain hoist. But, um, you know, we'll get, we'll do a little bit of that. When I uh, was going through the list of attendees today, I noticed that there was a, a, a preponderance of people who, um, you know, well, who have been to this, these sessions before, and I, I thank you for, you know, continuing to join us, but there's a lot of people here who know an awful lot about chain hoist, and, um, you know, I, I appreciate your stepping in. Um, if you have comments, you know, about anything that I'm talking about, or you want to add something, please don't hesitate, you know, speak up, throw it in the chat, yell at us, you know, turn your mic on and yell at us, whatever. Um, but what I want to make clear is to the people here who may not have as much experience with chain hoists um, and actually did come to, to, to learn a few things or hopefully get a couple of you know, pearls of knowledge out of this session, don't be shy, don't be intimidated by the, uh, the rest of the ne'er-do-wells in the group and uh, please speak up. So, cause you know, it's kind of why I'm doing this. I want to make sure that people have, uh, have uh, you know, a clear understanding of, of the topics, you know, by the time we're done. Okay. Okay, let's do that. It, yes, it is still true. And once again, please, if you're going to uh, claim research credits, for this class, you need to tell me, I'm not gonna guess. And you need to tell me in a reasonable amount of time. If you send me a, uh, a note, if you, if you send me a reminder on Saturday, um, I, I may not notice, I may not pay attention. Um, so, you know, the next day or two would be really helpful. That way I don't have to keep going back to the admin and adding in yet another name, okay? All right, now I have no idea what the next slide looks like. So I'm starting a year off the same way I ended it. I suppose the last year, I suppose. Okay, right. So we are talking about chain hoists today. And for the most part, I'm going to be, I'm going to be using uh, CM Lodestars as my example du jour, because that's the one that I have the most experience with. Um, those of you who have uh, more experience with some of the other brands out there, um, well, these are not other brands, excuse me. These are not other brands. These are brands that are owned by CM. Um, but if you have experience with, I don't know, StageMaker, Chainmaster, Verlin, Liftkit, uh, any of the other European, for example, the uh, European chain hoists, um, um, I don't know, is, 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 does four wall, um, no, excuse me, area four, that's a Freudian slip, area four, um, do they still have that uh, point hoist that they were, they were pushing for a while through um, total fabrications with Adrian? Does anybody know? Total isn't carrying it anymore because I had to try and find information and I don't think it's being made anymore. Okay. Uh, and Tate is making their own, I believe. Is any? I don't. I, I'm not sure. I'm not certain of that, but I believe they're making their own. Um, I have to ask because the the last Tate hoist I had were basically them throwing their brains on lift kits. On lift kit, okay. Yeah, and that happens, you know, fairly often. Um, stage. Uh, Stage makers, for example, I was a dealer for stage maker for just a brief period of time a few years ago, and uh, they were made in the United States, but um, the ones used in the States anyway were made here, but um, it's a Verlin product, it's a, it's a French product, they were uh, assembled uh, here in the States, and some of the parts were made here. So just because there's 47 different chain hoist names out there doesn't necessarily mean that there's 47 different manufacturers. Okay. Um, 
quick history for those of you who may not be familiar with chain hoist. And I got to start off with, with this one comment. Wally Blount would, would yell at me if I didn't say this. Um, I also happen to agree with him completely. Um, you'll notice, and hopefully I won't make the mistake during the session, but I will be calling these devices uh, chain hoists. Um, I know a lot of people, almost everybody calls them chain motors, um, which is not accurate. Uh, a chain motor is a little device inside those hoists there um, that turns a shaft, that turns a sprocket, that makes you know the hoist go up and down on the chain, or in some cases, the chain go up and down in the hoist. Um, the assembly, the, the, that whole body, that orange body or that black body with all the guts inside is a chain hoist. And I'm gonna keep doing this and I'm gonna keep saying this. I have been fighting this losing battle most of my career and I see no reason to stop now. All right, so. I have continued that fight with you. I, 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 and now I've been redoing all my, all my inventory and I'm changing it from motor to hoist. Okay, well, I appreciate that, Scott. But it's you and me against the world, near as I can tell. Um, Quick history, uh, it's open to chain hoists here in the States anyway, have been around for a long time. Uh, CM and other brands were in use industrially and commercially long before the entertainment industry. Uh, it wasn't until the mid sixties that um, uh, the entertainment industry discovered them. Um, there is some debate on who actually discovered um, uh, chain hoist and started using them in the entertainment industry, uh, mostly you know, for the touring folks. Um, I've heard um, Roy Bickle's name mentioned on a number of times. And there are a couple of other people. There's one other person who has a, a pretty good lock on, a pretty good hold on that claim, but I'll be damned if I can remember who it is. Um, so you know, if anybody has a thought on that one, they wanna offer it, please do. Um, but back in the day, chain hoists looked like the orange one on the screen, uh, or actually they were, they were more often silver back in those days. And um, they operated the way you see that chain hoist. The orientation is hoist up. Um, so the hook would clip into, you know, whatever the beam, uh, the clamp, the, uh, the, the, the swing arm overhead in the factory and the, the, the body of the hoist would remain motionless and the chain would go up and down. And that was the upright application. And that's the way people started using them when we started you know, using uh, hanging lighting truss with them and stuff. It didn't take very long at all to figure out that hauling a chain hoist all the way up in the air was um, not something that uh, anybody wanted to do for any amount of time. So we started trying to turn them upside down, what we call back in those days, the inverted position, and um, which is what the one on the right looks like, where the chain is stationary and the hoist climbs the chain. In the early days, um, you had many challenges to operating a hoist in that orientation. The primary challenge was the fact that the uh, contactor, the electrical contractor, contactor inside the hoist was um, gravity fed. So it only worked when it was upright. And if you tried to turn it upside down, inverted, the contactor would not work, but it would still try to work. Power would be coming, would be, trying to get through it, it would not function properly. And it would burn out in a very short period of time, usually a matter of seconds. And, you know, and then you had what's affectionately referred to as a boat anchor um, instead of a chain hoist. Um, as we'll see in, a, in just a couple of minutes when I get to the next couple of slides, CM helped us out with that eventually. I mean, what we did in the early days, and early days, I mean, in the seventies, um, and into the early 80s, um, because it was a gravity-fed contactor, we wanted to use the hoists 
in the inverted position in this position. So we would take the contactor out of the machine, turn it upside down and put it back in the machine. So now it only worked in the inverted position. And if you got into an upright situation, that's when it would burn out. But I mean, we didn't do that very often. Um, there wasn't a lot of hoist use in hotel ballrooms, you know, alternative spaces or other low ceilinged areas. So there wasn't a lot of, you know, upright use or uh, not much call for upright use. Um, so they were they were all inverted. The the contactor situation was re resolved, and we were using them in the inverted uh, orientation. Uh, my experience now with people, especially people new to the industry, some of the younger folks out there, um, they don't understand that terminology. Um, and when they talk about if somebody says we want to use a hoist in the inverted orientation. Um, to them, that means going from this, you know, this orientation to this orientation. Um, it doesn't really matter at this point which way you use it. As a rigger, however, I like accuracy in my terminology and in my, um, my definitions. So I think it would be nice if, uh, if, if we all um, landed on, on a particular way to call them and uh, you know, and stuck with that. Uh, or the alternative is just call it motor up or motor down. It's no longer an issue with the contactor, uh, whether you know it's upright, you know, or inverted, because somewhere oh, in the early '90s, I want to say, uh, CM understanding that we were having a challenge using the hoist and we would forget or the hoist would get turned on its side a bit and, uh, and, and burn out the contactor. They came up with a new contactor and um, that was spring loaded, no longer gravity fed. And um, so now it worked in any orientation and you didn't have to worry about how it was situated inside the hoist, okay? Um, and, you know, I'm not an electrician by any stretch of the imagination, as any of my friends will attest. But uh, just for those of you who are curious, a, um, an inverted, um, I'm sorry, a contactor is the device that takes the electricity coming into the machine and um, conditions it and sends it to the motor. You know, what that conditioning is, I, I don't know. Um, and also, Bear with me for a second here. Oh, there it is. I couldn't get to my uh, to my chat box there for a second. Hey, Bill. Yes, sir. Just like a switch. Like a switch. But if you're doing three phases, it turns all three phases on at one time. Homer, if you could start that again, I don't know about anybody else, but you broke up and I couldn't understand anything but the last couple of words. A contactor, like we use in lighting, contactor inside the um, motor would be just like a like three switches in parallel. It's just a switch. Okay. And the switch would all energize all three phases at the same time. I don't really think it conditions the power per se. It just it's able to handle a, a very high inrush of current. You know, because okay. you've got a feeding and lagging phases on the power because of the motor inductance. So the contactors, it's just like a giant switch with a lot of heavy duty current rating on the contacts. Okay. Yeah. Relay driven, multi-pole switch. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. As mentioned, the, uh, uh, my, my, my level of experience with electricity is um, lacking. So no um, more rubber bands? Yeah. It also keeps uh, three phase out of your hand when you're controlling it, which is the code. Right. And always a good idea too. Scott Spidell, lectern and podium. Um, I guess, you know, I guess we could, we could call one way a lectern and the other way a podium. No, just the things we argue about. <laughs> trying to get things that are clear. Yeah, you know, I've uh, I've been yelled at when somebody asked me to take the podium off the stage 
and um, you know, I take you go out on the stage and you take the lectern, take it off the podium, put it down, and then pull the podium off the stage. You know, and they, they look at me like I'm crazy, but that's what they told me to do. A man after my own heart. I've done that too. It's fun. <laughs> so, going back to the chain hoist here for just a minute. Um, in my opinion, and, and I think a number of you will share that opinion, um, a chain hoist is one of the most elegant material handling devices that, uh, that's out there. And by elegant, I mean that it's really simple. There's not a lot to it. And it's designed, you know, CM, you know, I don't know who invented a chain hoist. I didn't look, I never looked that up, but CM products are incredibly robust and, you know, they run for forever. Um, even when you abuse the hell out of them. Uh, and the other, most of the other hoist manufacturers, you know, followed in their lead. I mean, there are a couple of them that aren't, aren't terribly, uh, aren't as reliable as, as some of the others, but I'm not going to mention any names. Uh, um, Cause I don't want a horse head in my, in my, in my bed tonight. Um, the point I wanted to make about chain hoists and the fact that they are a material handling device, which is what they were in, in, invented to do, pick stuff up and then put it down, pick stuff up and then put it down, you know, mounted to a, a swing arm in a factory so that it swung out and picked up the, the Chevy short block six cylinder engine and stuck it into a pickup truck 25, 30 times a day or whatever it was, okay? Um, they're not, they were originally not designed to do what we do with them, you know, in the entertainment industry, you know, lifting loads over people's heads, holding loads over people's heads. And to this day, we're not allowed to do that sort of thing. Let me see if this is the right, this is the right page. And let me make that bigger for you here. So this is a page in the owner's manual. Let's see if I can get this. Bear with me while I mess with my screen here and try and organize a little bit. Of particular interest are some of the items. And again, this is right in the owner's manual. You buy a hoist, you get you know, a nice little booklet of uh, material. Do they still put them out in paper form or do you have to go online and download them? Anybody, uh, anybody know? But regardless of how you get it, you know, you're not allowed to do a whole lot of stuff. Um, yeah, you got to thoroughly read and understand the operating manual and parts manual before you operate a hoist. Has anybody done that ever? Um, you never. You're not allowed to lift a, a rated a, a load that's higher than the rating of the hoist. We never never do that it's downloadable bill uh downloadable okay cool i didn't know if they i know that it was downloadable i didn't know if they still you know, like sent a, a paper copy out when you bought one it's been a while since i've bought a hoist um look number six we're not allowed to lift support or transport people number seven we're not allowed to lift loads over people okay do rock stars count um you know, I mean, there's all this stuff that we're not allowed to do with a chain hoist, but we do with a chain hoist every day. Um, and I want to point this out to you because you need to know that these uh, requirements, these regulations, these manufacturer specifications exist. Um, and yet we still do it. You know, we still break these rules every day. Uh, it is not common in this country anyway, to raise a hoist up in the air, carrying a low, carrying a lighting truss or whatever, and then attach or somehow affix a secondary suspension. You know, we don't ever do that. Does anybody in this, in this group do that on a regular basis? Yeah, that many, okay. I can say there's been a couple of venues uh 
that I used to have to do that in. I can't. It's been so long. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And a couple of shows, like a Disney, at one point required secondary suspensions on everything. Right. And I think there was a place in Indianapolis uh, that required secondary suspensions on everything. Okay. But you're right. It's not a lot. Very few and very far between. Yep. It used to be that in when you went over to Europe. Um, yeah, you would find it in, a, in many places. Certainly, I would say the majority of places, um, you know, especially when you're doing, you know, trade shows or, or in, uh, uh, corporate events or whatever, in, in ballrooms and in convention centers and that sort of thing, that secondaries were the norm, if not the rule. Um, that's changing to a certain extent due to the, uh, the new regulations of the reasonably new regulations that have come out of Germany, the DIN standards um, that are requiring um, modifications to uh, what we would consider a standard chain hoist to, uh, to make it okay, suitable and, and uh, allowable to use it for lifting loads over people's heads. Um, we're not gonna really get down, that, get down that road today unless you really want to. But it involves double brakes, uh, uh, a multi-pocket drive wheel uh, for the chain, and, and a couple of other fun and frivolous things. Um, so I want to go back to the chat here. Somebody asked a question. How do we get away with using chain hoist for overhead use when they tell us not to? Um, how many, and show of hands or just speak up, how many of you have been involved in a show where a chain hoist failed? And I mean, failed catastrophically, where it, it fell or it released its load um, due to a hoist, either a manufacturing defect or a, a, a problem in, in, you know, integral to the hoist itself, not just because nobody, nobody maintained or serviced the thing in 20 years never never ever right ever i know of one I have, sorry i have motors in cipriani's 42nd street that have been there for long before i've been there like over a decade and never had a slip never moved a quarter of an inch ever right and you're still using them and they have not been serviced, no doubt. They, no, they get they started becoming serviced when Tony Bonilla came in there in uh -huh. 2003, 2004. Um, but we do service them annually. But I still there, even in other venues, I've seen uh, Hammerstein being one of them <laughs> um, has not been serviced. I know for a fact because I know a lot of people there and they, and they have been in there for multiple decades and have not been serviced and have never had an issue ever. CMs. Yeah, I think I sold some, a, a fair number of uh, load stars to Hammerstein back in, in the late eighties, early nineties. Early nineties. And uh, I think Mike put in the grid system there. Yeah. With uh, Chris Martin and Tony Bonilla and quite a few other old heads. Right. I'm at the, I was going to say, I'm at the Fox in St. Louis mm -hmm. and uh, the Billy Joel musical, I can't remember what the name of it was, had a two ton that failed. The act, the chain failed on it. The chain failed. Yeah. And it, it evidently failed right at the hoist body. They're not quite, no one was able to figure out exactly why it failed. Uh huh. Um, but that's the only one I've ever heard of actually failing. Right. I know of, and 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 I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention names or anything. But there were two brand new load stars um, that had just been purchased and delivered to a, a tour, and tour was in rehearsal, and they hung them, and started to lift the truss that they were picking up, and a chain broke, brand new, out of the box. Um, you know. Stuff happens. There isn't a manufacturer out there that's infallible. You're going to um, you're going you're going to find, you know, failures in in, in everything. Uh, it's a question of how often that failure happens, and what happens afterward. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. The load had barely gotten up off the ground, a couple of feet, if that, um, when the chain broke. And as I understand it, I was not on site, so I am working a bit from hearsay. 
but um, uh, my understanding is that CM had a representative on site within hours. And because CM uh, um, batches their chain, you know, it, all the chain is load marked, uh, batch marked, sorry. Um, they knew where all the chain that came out of that batch was. It wasn't just in those two hoists and nothing else. I mean, there was another hoist that it were around the country, if not around the world. And they pulled it all, took it all back, replaced it. You know, they you know, didn't even think twice about it. So, I mean, it's that kind of um, customer service that you want to see in, in a device that um, you're going to walk underneath when it's got 2,000 pounds worth of audio gear hanging, hanging from it. The whole point here, and it, we, it, not to belab belabor this, but the whole point of it is that chain hoists, by and large, are an incredibly reliable device. And we do what we do, not because we have any kind of dispensation or anything, but because we know that if the hoists are going to, if we take care of the equipment, maintain it properly, that it will do the job and the chances of failure are so remote that we don't have to worry about it. Um, Joel Schumann asks the question, how do insurance companies see this? Um, well, we try not to talk to insurance companies, Joel, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, you know, because the incidence of failure is so slight, it, my assumption here, because it's never come up with my insurance company, um, but, you know, they don't ask about it because it's not on their radar because it doesn't happen. So, but we want to keep this in mind. What this speaks to is that if you own hoists or, as we'll talk about in a little bit, as you run hoists or you encounter hoists on a job site, um, it's imperative that they be ma maintained properly, inspected and serviced. In, in an appropriate manner, given the use of that hoist. Okay, so where am I going first here? Ah, okay, let me, let me shrink that up a little bit. You know, I was debating what, how to start this off, this class off, whether right to go, to go right for the jugular first or, or not. But I think we'll go for the jugular because I don't want it to get short changed at the end when we start running out of time. There are a lot of things to go going on with the chain hoist operationally. Um, there's potentials you know, of failure, uh, sometimes catastrophically, if, uh, if the hoists aren't maintained properly um, and if they're overloaded and especially if they're not maintained properly and overloaded all at the same time. But there is one Call it an accident, for lack of a better word. There's one accident that um, that happens regularly um, in all venues, in many, many venues, many load ins, load outs, whatever. Um, that's extremely dangerous. It is a uh, a catastrophic accident, and I'm wondering if somebody wants to um, offer a suggestion of what that accident might be. Chain spill. Chain Say it again. Chain spill. Chain falling. Chain spill. Yep, spilling out of the bag. Chain spill. Okay, right. Well, yeah, you got it right on the nose. You've taken my class before, huh? Uh, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> of all the things that we can talk about today, I believe that this is you know right right behind maintain and service your hoist appropriately. Um, I believe that this is the most important thing that we need to worry about. Chain falls out of a bag on a regular basis. Sometimes it falls out of the bag when it's, you know, sitting on the ground, sometimes a foot in the air, and sometimes when it's 70 feet in the air. Um, a foot in the air on the ground, yeah, not so much of a problem. 70 feet in the air, you got a problem. You got a serious problem. Um, that much chain coming out of a bag um, you know, the hoist started out sitting on the floor or at least very close to being on the floor. So it's, if it's 70 feet in the air, it's got roughly 70 feet of chain that is coming down at you. And it's terminal velocity. 
it will it will do just an incredible amount of damage. Uh, it can hurt people. Um, there was, and I don't remember whether it was Lady Gaga or, or I don't remember which one uh, it was, Pink, one of those. And I think it was in Belgium a couple of years back where a chain came out of a bag during a show and came down into the audience and oh, wow. hit an audience member. And they got really lucky, hit him on the shoulder. And- um, Oh, I've heard about this one. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I, I, I hadn't muted my light. I, I heard about that one. I just- yeah. Chain came out of a bag and- um, They got hit in the shoulder and they yeah. got hurt, but they weren't, they weren't maimed. Well, they, they survived. Um, yeah. I, you know, it, you know, did a fair amount of damage. I'm, I'm not interested in having chain fall 10 feet or five feet and hitting me in the shoulder. And this came from significantly higher than that. Did the tail of the chain stay at the motor or did it come loose from the motor? Well, I don't know on this particular one. And that's, uh, you know, that, that's a topic for discussion because you'll see, as you see in the photo there, and these are my hoists, um, the tail is not attached to the hoist body. Uh, we don't do that. CM does not require one way or another unless they've changed their, uh, their position on that in the last you know, six months or so. Um, but uh, CM does, as far as I know, they don't care whether the hoist chain is attached to the hoist body or not. My, uh, uh, the reason, there are a number of reasons why you do or do not um, attach the tail to the, um, to the, put a soft link in, into the bolt here. Um, we choose not to. Okay. Um, so I don't know. Because Tony B mandates that we have at least a Sunday that goes into the hook. And I've seen even Sunday snap, yeah. you know, uh, uh, you know, AC cable, uh, Nyko pressed, but Tony B mandates that we have all our hoists have a connection to the motor itself do you is there a reason why i mean he hasn't explained that to us he just says that he thinks it's safer and um, and and that is a position that is you know a perfectly acceptable position to take um and what you know i haven't talked to him about it but my assumption is that he is trying to um Make, you know, control the damage when a chain runs out of a bag. Now, if you've got 70 feet of chain in a bag and it comes out, but it's attached to the, to the hoist body, then you only have, <clears throat> excuse me, you only have 35 feet of chain coming down before it runs out of chain because mm -hmm. the other 35 feet is going back up to the hoist body. Um, it's been my experience in the past that when that happens, um, the attachment mechanism the attachment device to the hoist body typically fails mm -hmm. or um it's that maybe the attachment device doesn't fail but that bolt right in here that fails well we go, of, we people, go through the hook so yeah i was i was going to tell the shackle down at the underside of the body yeah we go into that and then i've noticed or we've noticed that uh, since Crosby came and made us do the Sundays with the double Nikos now, not just one, it's a lot stronger connection. And we haven't seen when we do see a chain fall, uh, we haven't seen that it snaps or, uh, it, you know, takes out the, the Nyko press. Right. We don't go to the bolt. We go to the actual hook that's at the shackle connection. You go to the suspension hook? Correct. Interesting. Okay. Or we'll go to the top of, you know, what it's connected to at the beam or the um, whatever that connection point is on top. There are pros and cons to all of this, and we could probably spend the next three days talking about it, um, you know, the various methods of doing it or not doing it. And I'm happy to do that, but let me give you my position on the, on the whole process and we can, we can go from there. Um, I'm all about education. I'm all about solving the problem not, you know, fixing a, you know, fixing a, uh, 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 I lost the word. It's not symptom, but, you know, you know, uh, trying, trying to mitigate uh, the result, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, 
I want to make sure that the chain doesn't come out of the bag. Uh, I don't ever want to be in a position of, you know, having a chain coming out of the bag and then trying to figure out, you know, later on what we should do about that. Um, there are so many things that you can do to make sure the chain doesn't come out of the bag um, that what you do with the tail of the chain shouldn't matter. Um, you know, with a couple of things that you um, you described, you know, I could find some some reasons why I would or would not do that based on what that action or what that connection does to the rest of the um, to the rest of the rig, the rest of the assembly. But for me, the best thing is don't let it happen. For those of you who are or don't have as much experience, um, one of the things to, with using hoist, one of the things to remember, and one of the things that causes chain to run out of a bag is that when you start a chain hoist, when you push the button to tell it to go, whether it's up or down, the system bounces. And the reason it bounces is because when you, there is no, on a standard, normal, everyday chain hoist, doesn't have any kind of, you know, electronic, you know, bells and whistles on it. Um, you, you tell the hoist to run, it wants the motor inside, wants to run full speed instantly. So if that, that hoist is running at 16 feet per minute, it wants to do it instantly. But it doesn't, it can't do it very well if there's 2000 pounds worth of stuff hanging underneath it. So you push the button and the chain, the, the motor inside goes, okay, and starts to spin and then, uh oh, you know, it's got all that weight. So there's that lurch, which creates the bounce in the hoist, creates, you'll see the bounce, you know, manifested in the truss, certainly, but it also manifests itself in the chain. And when the chain starts to bounce, it can do bad things. It, it'll start bouncing around and it can do stuff that you don't want it to do. Okay, so there are a number of things that we can do. I'm gonna run down them briefly here. That too will, that will avoid um, uh, chain running out of the bag. The first is, and this is just so much common sense, I can't believe I have to say it, but you have the right size bag. Uh, people have different, some people have different size bags for, you know, one ton hoists and half ton hoists, right? Um, you put a half ton hoist on a, a half ton bag on a one ton hoist, uh, you run the risk of filling the bag and having the, you know, the chain run out of bag before you run out of chain. And then it spills out the top and out it goes. And when it spills out the top, it's just going to bring everybody else with it. All right. So having the right bag attached to the hoist is paramount. I don't know, I suspect other people are doing, I haven't seen it, uh, but we color code our bags. That's a one ton hoist, it's got red hooks on the bag. That means it's a one ton bag. Um, Scott, help me out here. Do you, going back a million years, do you remember what we painted the half ton hooks? Um, that must have started after I left because we weren't doing that when I was there. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah. so you started that after 2002. After 2002. Okay, cool. Well, there you are. Um, but I like the system. Yeah. You know, so the other, the, the half ton bags are painted a different color. I don't remember. I apologize. So easy enough to, to locate in the, in the, in the, at three o'clock in the morning when you're loading in a show. Um, you match up the bags, you know, especially if you have half ton and one ton hoists scattered around the room. Uh, the other thing to make sure of is that those hooks are, are oriented properly as they are in this photograph. Um, and this is something that people miss and it's easy to miss, especially, you know, if, if you know, you're working your second call of the day and you're loading in at 3 a.m. and you just got off of, you know, the out at 1 a.m. somewhere else, and you got 125 or 150 hoists that are going in the air. If one of these hooks is turned the other way, when you push that button and the hoist starts to run and everything bounces, this chain is gonna bounce and jiggle back and forth. And sure enough, it'll grab that hook and snap it right off. And when it does that, 
then the chain bag is no longer you know filling up properly and it all spills out i think the next picture yeah there's the wrong way you know and you know we cheated here i i i pulled it over by hand to show you what the concern is but you know it's possible to do i think i know i've certainly seen it happen um so make sure that those hooks are oriented in the in, in the in the prop, proper uh they're pointed in the proper direction stick them out um let's see all right we did that already let's stop doing that all right making hey, sure bro. that the yeah go ahead you write the number of feet of chain on the hoist on the hoist body say it again do you write the number of feet of chain on the hoist body so if you have a two ton that has a 60 foot run or a 75 foot run you would make sure you grab the correct hoist yeah well you, you can't it's hard to see on this one was it on this one yeah, there, yeah this is the six this is a 60 footer it's got 60 feet of chain on it so y'all do that on all yours so you'll know you get the right one yeah okay yeah. I now and if, if we were to pull let's say we pulled the chain out of that one put a 90 or 100 125 into that hoist then we're going to to cover that mark up and put the right length on it you know it, it nice. nobody wants I to mean, pull. yeah it's just little things like that i can just see somebody grabbing a a, a 60 foot chain when you need 75 you know and now you got a problem <laughs> Yeah, you need a very tall ground rigger. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, the hoist is going to start out 15 feet off the ground. Um, so, yeah, we mark our, we mark, you know, communication is everything, folks. I mean, we color code our hooks. We mark our, our, our hoists so we know how much chain is in that particular hoist. Um, you know, we don't go and mark a, a one ton. We don't mark this as a one ton and, and, and a half ton. We don't, we don't mark a half ton on it. Um, if you can't tell the difference between a, a half ton and a quarter ton and a, and a one ton, um, we're not gonna invite you back. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So what do we got here? Okay, so here's another reason the chain falls out of the bag. Um, you know, as, as, as many of you know, um, and this started, and I, I think this started in the fashion world back in, in, in the late 90s, where chain, lighting designers were all worried about where the bags were positioned from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, you know, they didn't like to see the bags hanging over the side of the bag because it's hanging hang over the side of the truss because it made a bump there and it wasn't, it wasn't you know, it wasn't pretty. Uh, my point to, to the LDs was that if they're look if the audience is looking at the bags and the show's in trouble anyway, but, but you know, they don't want to listen to that. Um, Cindy has asked, do we keep different bags for the really long chains? Yes, yes. Um, most of my chains are 60s. I have 90s. I also have some hundreds. Um, and I think we have a couple 125s floating around. We don't use them too often. Um, but uh, we have, if, if we have uh, bags for the 100 footers and 125s, I think it's the same bag. Uh, going back to this, yeah, you know, if they're looking at, at, at the bags and the show's in trouble, so quit worrying about it, but that doesn't go over very well. So we end up having to put the bags into the hoist. Now this bag is in a 12 inch box truss. You have to be really careful to make sure that the bag is in that um, um, in that truss properly so that it's not folding up on itself. It's not decreasing the volume of that bag, you know, because if you're piling it up and it sits on a cross member underneath and, you know, you know let's say the bag's 24 or, 24 or 30 inches long and now it's only 24 inches long, you can't put as much chain in it and now you have the risk of it running out of the top again, because you fill the bag. You got to make sure. Um, going back to, I think, this photograph. Now, let's use this one. 
one of the biggest issues with chain and bag relationship um, is to make sure that when you start out, you know, you've loaded the truss, everything, you know, the, the truss is hanging from the hoist and the, the truss is, is floating. And then, you, you know, the next, the next deal is to send it up to trim. You want to make sure that the chain is down inside the bag. I would, you know, I'll live with it halfway down in the bag. What I really want is the chain touching the bottom of the bag. I want gravity. I want weight doing its job for me. Because as I said, when you push the button and the hoist starts to move and the truss starts to move, it all starts to bounce and this chain will start to sway back and forth. And if it does it strong enough, you, could, you have the potential of the chain running across the rim or the lip of the bag and doing what I call its little boa constrictor thing, where it just starts going, you know, layering, looping over the, uh, the, the rim of the bag. And it'll keep doing that right up until there's enough weight for it to have to make a decision whether it falls into the bag or falls out of the bag. We all know which way that decision is going to go. So you want to start out with the chain down halfway, at least halfway. I would love it if you had chain touching the bottom of the bag. Now let's assume that you don't have, as the guy said earlier, let's assume that you don't have enough chain on your hoist and you're starting out, you know, with the with the with the the the, the, the chain all all the way run out right up on onto its limit switch, and the chain is only sitting an inch or two into the bag. Well, the thing you want to do then is you want to run the, the whole system, but whatever it's carrying, you want to run it up two feet and stop and then go check the bags and make sure that the chain is sitting down in the bag. And there's, it's down far enough that its weight will keep it in the bag. You know, it pisses people off when you have to stop and you want to run, you got to run around and check 15 or 20 bags. You know, it takes, gee, maybe two or three, maybe four whole minutes to do that. Um, when people yell at you for that, explain how much longer it's gonna take when a chain falls out of a bag 45 feet in the air after you have put the scenery in underneath it. You can't get a hoist, you can't get a lift in there to put the chain back in the bag. See how long that takes. Um, Lucas, I see your question. Um, th 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 you're asking a question that people have asked, oh, I don't know, since the, the dawn of time. Um, and the class takes, I think, three months to complete. Uh, no, I'm kidding. But um, how to wrap a hoist is not um, what we're going to talk about today because it's going to take too long. But um, that is the sapsis rigging preferred method. There are many methods. We can talk about this at the tail end of the class if we have time. Copy you. Um, yeah, as Jacob said, helpful to check that the bottom of the chain bag is not holding up the bottom of the truss in that configuration. Yeah, it can get caught in there. And, and your slings to hoist connection uh, are no longer carrying the load, your, your chain bag is carrying a load. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't wanna. Um, yeah, I guess I could have used this one as the example of making sure that the chain runs all the way into the bag, but that's, you know, that's just showing you, you know, you know, the chain, I'm gonna assume, cause it's in my shop, that the chain starting out is all the way down in the bottom. But if it's not, if it's up here, you know, less than halfway into the bag, run it up a couple of feet, stop it and check it. Um, and then you want to check it when it gets to high trim. When, you know, whether I don't care whether it's 30 feet in the air or 100 feet in the air, you want to check the bag. Um, and I learned this the hard way. It was a long, long, long time ago. Um, and I've never had this problem since because we check. Um, but what happened was I was doing an industrial in San Diego for a car company. And, um, you know, it was this typical dog and pony thing for the for the uh, for the car show it was you know three days of of market sales manager meetings and all that and they were all exactly the same and each one ended with the ceo doing their little speech and off off we went 
Um, so at the last day, the last show, we're standing backstage waiting for them to finish so we can get started on the strike. And as most of you who have experienced this know, I heard the first two clicks of the chain coming out of a bag. And we all know what that sound, most of us know what that sound is like, it, and we really ever, don't ever want to hear it. And here I was backstage, the CEO is on stage talking, and I got a chain running somewhere, but I can't find it. It landed about eight feet directly upstage of the CEO. Now, fortunately, you know, nobody got hurt. Um, that chain and that truss and hoist never moved during the show. They sat there. So I'm imagining that either it was looped over the, lip, rip, the rim of the bag or it had filled the bag and it just was sitting there with excess piled up on top. And you know, music and the vibration of the building and everything just slowly over the course of the week inched its way to the edge of the bag until finally gravity took over and out it came. Even at 100 feet, get a really, really bright light and a pair of binoculars, check your bags, make sure the chains are inside the bag. Yeah. Does anybody use this bag anymore? I hope not. Well, I, yeah, I was going to say, if you're using this bag for, for a chain hoist, stop. Mr. Oliver, you said yes. Are you saying yes to my question? Some of my older hoists do have that style bag. They only have one attachment point on the hoist. Right. Um, my recommendation, my friend, would be to not do that. Take it out. Replace it. I don't it. use them, but there's companies that come into my building that have them. All the more reason to be checking the chains because this distance from hook to rim is longer than on the other, the, the double hook bags. And um, you, got, you got more room for issues. And they tip, that thing tips constantly. Oh yeah, they tip all the time. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about one more, uh, yeah, only as a tool, a really big chalk bag. Yeah, that's a lot of chalk, my friend. Um, Let's talk about one more mechanical thing and we'll talk about operation briefly. Um, limit switches. We all get in and we all mess around with the limit switches at one point in time or another because we got low ceilings and we want to scoot the, uh, the chain hoist up to, um, up to the hook as best we can. And one of the ways to, that we do that is they mess with the limit switches. They, they back off the limit switches and stuff. Um, you need to be really careful when you're messing around with limit switches because you can leave the switch in a condition where it will not function properly. And when you close up the, um, the housing, the body of the hoist, you may not know it you know, uh, because you may not have heard the sound that uh, I'm, I'm about to describe here. Here's a limit switch. Um, the motor, the way this works, okay, we'll start off with the stuff you can't see um, come on over here. There we go. Let's do that. This shaft right here with a little worm gear, little plastic worm gear on it, showing, showing its age, um, that runs down to the actual motor. So the motor turns on and spins this shaft. The worm gear turns this gear. It's attached to this shaft. Now that shaft is threaded and the bore on each one of these sprockets is also threaded. You know, so the inside of that sprocket, the hole, it's threaded so that if you were to capture, as this thing has done, you capture these two sprockets, turn on the machine, so the shaft is spinning, but the sprockets can't turn, they're gonna track back and forth along the shaft. <clears throat> and when they track, they're gonna go and they're gonna get to the end of their travel distance and they're gonna hit a limit switch. And in this case, and let me just check something here real quick. Yeah, um, that little white thing right there, a little button right there is the upper limit switch. So right now we're pretty much sitting on the lower limit switch, go in the other direction and we're gonna track across and hit that switch, boom. The machine turns, turns off, everybody's happy. When you go in to mess with the limit switches to change their position, the way it's done is, well, first, 
I always have to remember to tell people, turn off the power. <laughs> and then you have this plate right here, which ends up with the little, the little lip inside the gap on the teeth for those two sprockets. That's what holds them in place. It's spring loaded. So you just push that down. This guy pops out and then you can rotate the manually rotate the, 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 the gear, the sprocket along the shaft, either further away from the limit switch or closer to the limit switch, depending on what your, 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 uh, your objective is. The problem is that people don't always line up this lip inside the gap, you know, between the teeth properly. You know, they, they, you know, they, they rush through it and, you know, it may be sitting on top of a tooth rather than inside the gap and they're not aligned to each other. So when you close the housing, turn the hoist on, these sprockets have, have the ability to now turn, you know, just rotate on the shaft. And if they're rotating on the shaft, they're not going anywhere. They're never going to move. They're never going to track down and hit your upper or your lower limit switch. Those of us with, you know, a fair amount of experience know what the sound is like when you hear the sprocket turning and it's chattering along this, uh, this lip. Um, you're going to mess with the limit switches. Make sure that they're aligned properly. Okay. It's not a common occurrence, but it's common enough that I felt it necessary to bring it up here today. Okay. Um, yeah, oh, and I shall also should point out that back in the day, this arrangement with the spring here was not the way that this worked. This thing was actually, it was uh, uh, the, the, the plate here was bent over and there were a couple of screws. So you needed a tool to, um, to adjust the limit switches. And CM has always said, hey, don't mess with the limit switches. We set them at the factory and you don't have to mess around with them. And then at one point, while saying that, they turned around and said, okay, but if you want to mess with the limit switches, why don't we make it easier for you? And we'll put a little spring-loaded thing on here. Go figure, right? Um, okay, I'm just going to scroll through here and see if anybody has. Um... All right, so yeah, we're going to talk about operation real quick, if, um, if that's okay. What do we got, three o'clock? Okay. And let me jump into the... Um into the chat here. Um, Lucas, um, your comment, that's why we have reverse phase on, on the distro. And, and I gotta tell you, I, I really appreciate your spelling of the word phase there, because I think that that's probably more appropriate than the right spelling. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's very funny. Um, so, Instead of changing limit switches uh, in, the, in the body of the hoist, one of the things that people do is they will reverse, and this is with a three phase uh, hoist motor, they will reverse phase on the, uh, on the hoist so that you know, they change a couple of legs of power coming in. And when you push the up button, when you tell the hoist to go up because you have reversed the phase, um, the hoist is going to operate in the opposite direction. Um, and what that means is that if you want the hoist to go up, you got to push the down button. And as you're pushing the down button and the hoist is going up, the, ho the, the machine is going to function with the down limit, but it's going up. It's going to bypass the limit. You're going to be able to scoot your hoist up closer to the hook. This is not a highly recommended practice. Everybody does it, but you got to pay attention. You can't ever forget, all right? Because if you forget, then bad things happen. You know, the worst case scenario is you run your hook, you run the hoist right up into the chain hook that, uh, that's connected overhead. And um, it just turns out that that's a, that particular hoist is one that hasn't been serviced in next to forever. And you snap a link and, you know, somewhere in between the body of the hoist and the, um, and the hook. And now you have a hoist coming down to the ground. All right. 
um, phase reversal. Yeah, yeah, like I said, a lot of people do it. I'm not going to say you shouldn't do it, but you absolutely have to pay attention and know exactly what you're doing. You know, if you're working on a call and somebody, your supervisor, uh, you know, or the deck chief, the, the head, head rigger or whatever says, uh, reverse phase on that so that you uh, can get it going higher. If you do not know what you're talking, what they're talking about, if you're not absolutely certain what you're supposed to do, don't do it. Check back with your supervisor. Let them know that you're not comfortable. You're not familiar enough with it to do it. Um, because the, 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 the result can be really catastrophic. Can I add to that, please? Of course you can. Um, so when I, we do it a lot, like, because the, the, you know, whoever the client or the LD or whoever wants a higher trim and they didn't tell us that until later in the call or whatever the case is. Uh, but when we do do that, we have spotters, whether they're at the hoist or in the grid or, like you said, you know, if you got Binox or something or whatever, someone is keeping eyes on that machine yeah. or that hoist at all times. We don't just go willy nilly and be like, oh, reverse phase and just drive it until it stops. Right. Definitely don't do that. Yeah. Just yeah. to add well, to that. You know, and that's, you're exactly right. That is, a, if you're going to reverse phase, that is the procedure that you need to follow. Um, not everybody does that. Right. And not everybody knows that they have to do that. I mean, you know, unfortunately, there are still, um, you know, some people, you know, some companies out there that don't have as much experience or depth of knowledge as uh, as others, and they get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Would that require resetting the limit switches after you pull that trick? Negative. No, no, but it would require you reversing, unreversing the phase you when know, you get back, back in. into proper phase. Okay. Uh, let's see. Does anybody else have any hoist operational things? I can keep going, but because it's it's like ten after, I want to see. I want to make sure that I answer other people's questions. I'm going through uh, going through the chat here briefly. Do -de do -de do. You broke a limit switch using a motor out of face because you just kept running it, and it and it's and it just literally. It broke the limit switch or it broke the... Um... Um, what happened was my electrician wired up a temporary distro and I didn't realize he hadn't checked the phase and I was very, very green. This is like 20 years ago. And I just, yeah, I ran it past the limit switch to the point where internally it was damaged. We had to send the motor. It was a brand new motor. Yeah. Send it back and I was just like, okay, never doing that again. Yeah, well, you know. But at least it was on the floor. It wasn't like I was trying to hang something with it that day. So, you know, if you're going to screw up like that, at least you do that way. Right. Okay. Well, bearing, barring anybody else having other, other, other issues, I got a couple of other topics I want to, you know, issues I want to talk about briefly here. Um, you know, while we're talking about limits, which is, uh, you know, we all know that when at the end of the day, end of the show, at the end of the night, end of the loadout. Um, you run all the hoist, all the hoists are down on the deck and you run the chain all the way out um, so that it's ready for the next gig, right? Um, and you'll run it all the way out to the, until you hit a limit switch and then you'll back it up. You'll go in the other direction for a foot. And the reason you do that is you don't wanna leave that sprocket, as I showed you in the other slide, you don't wanna leave that sprocket sitting up against the limit switch. You know, that's just a little electromechanical switch. It's got a finite number of clicks in its little life, right? And you don't wanna waste any of those clicks by putting, you know, leaving the, the sprocket up against it, putting the hoist in the box, the box in the truck, and the truck going down the Jersey Turnpike, you know, between, exit 14a and and exit six um it's going to use up half of the clicks in its little life because it's just bouncing along clicking and clicking on that um on that limit switch itself so back it off a foot there's another real problem that hasn't happened terribly often but when it does it's really not good um, you're loading out a show you got a hundred hoists and typically it's the people 
who don't have much experience. It's the loaders, the ground riggers, or it's somebody <laughs> who gets stuck with the, or a, a few somebodies who gets stuck with the job of running the chains out on the hoists. And, you know, they're going to do it. And it's, it, it takes forever. It's a long process. Hoist run at 16 feet a minute. They got 60 feet of chain on them. It takes a while on each hoist. You get bored. You get complacent. You lose focus. If you're going to have your people doing it, especially the inexperienced folks, you must train them to stay away from the hoist. Now, with a CM Lodestar, their chain ports do not have a non-jam function. You can jam while you're running it um, with there's no tension on the chain. You can get that chain kinked and it will jam going into the port, going into the hoist body. So you got to hold on to the chain as it's going in. If you start out you know, a foot away from the, the hoist and you're running a 60 foot chain at 16 feet a minute, you're going to lose your focus. And you're going to find that you're kind of, because the chain is going into the, the hoist, you're being pulled ever so slightly towards the hoist body. You don't want to be pulled into the hoist body. I'm here to tell you that the chain port and the chain do not need the extra lubrication. So you need to train your people and, you know, hopefully the, the experienced folks know better, but everybody, but especially the new folks in town, they got to start, start out at least three feet away from the chain, uh, excuse me, away from the hoist. Because even under the best of circumstances, you know, you're going to find yourself drifting in towards that, towards that hoist and you don't want to run your finger into that chain port, okay? It's really important, but it's one of those things that people overlook, you know, and we all, you know, we all make the new, the new kids, you know, it's none of us want to do it, right? Um, okay, what else we got? Anything else in the, no, nope, nothing new there. Okay, so I got a hook here. Now let's just play pretend for a second that this is the, the hook, the hoist hook. So it's attached to the, to the body of the hoist. It's hanging underneath the, uh, the, the hoist. And those of you who have taken my class before, then you know where I'm going with this, so, but don't give it away. Um, so the next action is to connect the truss to it or whatever. You got a couple of uh, slings and a shackle and you're gonna put the shackle into that hoist uh, hook, right? Um, Um, <laughs> yeah, Scott, we'll get to that. So, so what you're supposed to do now, you got the shackle in your hand. It's in my right hand. I'm right-handed. So what you're supposed to do is take that, um, that safety latch with your, your, your other hand with your thumb and gently depress it and then carefully place the shackle into the hoist hook and then slowly release the safety latch. That's the way you're supposed to attach anything to a hoist hook, okay? That's not how you do it. Does anybody want to hazard, you know, anybody want to describe that briefly? What you really do? I just slam it in there. You slam it in there. Do you know why you do that? Uh, hopefully that spring on that latch works. No, but that's not the reason you slam it in there. There is a very, I'm sorry, what? At least my fingers get pinched half the time. Yeah. Well, there's a very specific reason. Jacob, you're close. It is easy. It's easier to just slap the, 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 the shackle in there. But the real reason you do it is because it feels good. It's a little <laughs> tiny reward that we all get. That sound that we all know and love of that shackle, you know, the pin smacking into the hook, going, you know, through the safety latch into the hook. Just, it's a reward. And Lord knows we need as many rewards as a rigor as we can possibly get, right? Um, I am never going to tell you that um, you have to do the thumb with the gentle pressure and the gentle release and all that gobbledygook. I'm never going to tell you that. But I am going to remind you that every time you smack a shackle into that hook, you're going to wear away a little tiny piece of, of metal off of the shackle pin and off of that hook, you know, somewhere along there, but typically right where that safety latch is engaging on the, uh, on the hook. 
Now we started off by talking how reliable these chain hoists are. They last forever. I bought my first hoist in 1981, and I don't doubt for a minute that I still have most of them in my inventory. And they have, uh, uh, you know, they've been, you know, serviced and parts replaced and all of that, you know, they're perfectly fine. You know, so long as you take care of them, they will last forever. So that hook is going to see thousands of shackle pins. That shackle that you just smacked in there, you know, may never see another hook in its entire life. You run a risk, and it is a small risk, a grant of that, but you run a risk of wearing off enough material right in here, right on the inside of the hook, that this hook may be attached to a one-ton hoist, but this hook isn't a one-ton hook anymore, you know? Um, and this is a ground rigger's re responsibility that when you are setting up a rig and you, um, you, you uh, uh, see the hook and the safety latch is not engaging the hook properly. You know, maybe it's not hitting right here. Maybe it's hitting further up on the hook, you know, higher than you would expect it to be, or it's swinging free. It's bypassing it all together. Um, that means that you got to stop and you got to, you know, resolve that issue. Most of the time, it's going to be the safety latch that's that's at fault because it's it's a fragile device and it's going to get beat up. Um, but there will be times, especially when you you look at the hoist and you realize that you know it's been around the block more than once or twice. Um, it could easily be the uh, the hook that is um, that is starting to bend out. Um, like I said, I'm never I'm never going to suggest that you stop smacking the shackles into the into the hook. I love that sound, but there are there are ramifications to that. Okay. Okay. Um, Joel, you had some questions. Let me get way back to the beginning. Unless somebody else has questions, um, Joel submitted a couple that I want to bring up here. Um, and the first question is, what is the best practice for moving multiple chain hoists at one time? Um, for example, a single span of truss with three hoists and a mother grid with 24 points or more. Well, you know, it really doesn't change in my mind anyway. It doesn't change whether you got two, three, or 30, you know, hoists moving at, at, at one time. You need spotters, and it can be a single spotter or multiple spotters, depending on A, the number of hoists that you're running and B, how far apart, how spread out the rig is. Um, so you gotta make sure that there are spotters who have the ability to pay attention to the hoist that they're supposed to pay attention to and that they're not, they're not spreading out their focus too far. You know, There's always people around, you, you know, use them. Um, do you bump hoists? Yeah, you wanna bump hoists. You wanna make sure that nothing has happened in between, you know, setting up and getting ready to take a, a, a rig to trim, you know, plugs come undone, um, you know, well, <laughs> phase reversal doesn't usually happen, you know, after you've checked it, after you've run the hoist the first time, and you know, when you're when you're setting up, um, but I suppose, you know, it could happen in, in under certain circumstances, but you wanna make sure that all of the hoists are operating properly as individuals before you ask them all to work as a single unit. Uh, and I just wanna to add to that, like that has happened to me before where I've had a rig where either electrics or whoever run a cable over my distro and, you know, it, it was after the fact where they've come through with a scissor lip, like some video company showed up late and was like, oh, we've, we've added this to the rig. And then they accidentally bumped the phase reverse. So that has happened to me many times. And I'd have to have a guy like rappel in or get in the lift and, and change that. Right. That sounds to me like I would want to be put, be bolting a uh, protector, you know, a little, a little device, a little plate, on top of my phase reversal switch so that, you know, even if somebody threw a bundle of cable on top of my distro, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't hit the um, phase reversal switch, you know? I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll email Tony B on that one. Okay. 
<laughs> tell, tell them tell them i said hello yes, uh, <laughs> um but you know you, you, you got to make sure everybody's working uh and you got to make sure that they stay working your spotters are not there just to get the rig started your spotters are there to make sure that the thing runs all the way up certainly not unusual for as a uh, as a, a light a big lighting rig going up in the air and you got a lot of cable hanging down on one side you know a plug comes undone maybe it was not made not all the way secured to begin with and it comes undone and one of your hoists stops running you know you're in a world of hurt if nobody's paying attention to that the other thing you want to be careful of and i caution you that if you are running a, a rig up in the air and somebody tells you to stop okay you stop you know even if they're wrong stopping is not a bad thing but you don't want to start too quickly remember we talked about the truss and the rig bouncing when you push the button well when you release the button it bounces for the, exactly the same reason you know it's the, the motor inside stops running instantly but that weight's going to move a little bit it's not, you know there's nothing telling it to hit the brakes right away so you get more bounce if you don't wait until the rig settles down and stops bouncing you know you go right back to put maybe you're you got a, a a 60 or a 70 foot run and your thumb got tired and it fell off the button and you go oh shit and you know you put your your thumb right back on the button again you know you're now exacerbating the uh, the bounce and you're causing it to bounce more and if you're running a heavy load uh, and you're getting close to capacity for your truss that much bouncing could put you over the line, could put you over the limit and cause a catastrophic failure. Okay, so you need to be careful about that. Uh, let's see what else. Eric has asked, may I record the session for referencing? You can, but we are recording it. Oh, Sarah, you've already answered them. Thank you. Um, okay. Jeff says I had, you had a Soka run. Um, that sounds like something you do on a, a on a track and field. Um, no, a Soka Pex run come undone. A seventy foot snorkel. To, yeah, of course. It never happens when you have clear floor space. You know, chain's going to come out of the bag when the bleachers are are, are already in place. It's certainly happened to me on uh, on several occasions. Uh, Joel is asking about load shift on the one point when bumping one at a time. You're going to get a load shift. Um, we are going to be doing at the end of the month. We're going to be doing a class on indeterminate structures, and that, and we will speaking be speaking directly to uh, load distribution and how specious, how how haphazard it really is, uh, regardless of what we think is going on. Um, um, you know, um, so yeah, you know, if you've got really heavy loads, um, your bumps don't want to be more than, you know, just enough of a bump to establish that A, it's working and B, it's moving in the direction you expect it to move. Norm, what are you asking? It seems that you are talking about hoist that lift equipment to a fixed position. Yes, they are the same hoists. Um, it was the same basic hoist, um, you know, a, a chain hoist, like a drum winch, it has basic components to it, uh, a motor, a shaft, uh, a sprocket, um, you know, those limit switches, that kind of thing. Um, if you're moving um, during during the show, if you're running cues with, with chain hoists, ideally you've got hoists that have been designed to do that, that they have programmable uh, control systems in them, that they have variable speed so that when you push the button to tell it to go, it doesn't bounce because it has an acceleration ramp, usually, you know, two or three seconds, uh, and a deceleration ramp, you know, a few seconds, so that it takes the jolt, takes the shock load out of that. Um, uh, I would, I would not want to see a regular old run-of-the-mill chain hoist, Lodestar or otherwise, used in a um, in a queue, a moving situation, unless 
it's you know it's sporadic it's if it's you know one or two times a night no big deal but if you know if you're picking up something you know you know all night long it's going up and down up and down you really do want to make sure that um that you have uh, better control of that chain hoist than just a, a standard push button. Um, Pamela, yeah, running chain out of the out of the hoist. Yeah, that's that happens when you um, a you don't have the end of the the tail hooked to the body, and you're running in phase reversal, and you forget because yeah, you'll run you'll run the chain right out of the um, um, right out of the hoist body and if it doesn't land on your on your toes um, which is good uh, that it doesn't do that it's at the very least it's extraordinarily embarrassing but keep in mind you have given everybody else on the crew something to talk about for at least the next three or four weeks okay i'm i you know we're we're, we're right at 3 30 um, we can talk about hoist from now until the cows come home because we use them all the time. Um, I'm happy to um, um, to uh, to stick around and, and answer more questions if you have them. Otherwise, um, thank you for um, for joining us today, and have a a good week. Next week, I have um, Andy Schmitz and Jonathan Duell joining me. Um, and we're going to be talking about aerial rigging and um, with, with, with the focus being on how that you as a venue, you know, the TD in a venue, how you talk to aerialists who are coming into your venue and how they talk to you, making sure that communication um, goes well is, you know, everybody is on the same page, that sort of thing. Okay. All righty then. Thank you all and have a great uh, rest of your week. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Thanks sir. Bill. Have a good day. Thanks for your help. Stay safe out there, huh? Yes. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, yeah, we'll get back to work, hopefully. Yeah, that wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> Uh, I do want to, uh, we don't have to do it now, but I do want to uh, ask your advice on the truss wrapping scenario that Tony can, B likes to do. We can, we can do that. Where was that photo? Um, I think it was like third. Uh, oh, right there. Yeah, that one. This one. Number there 10. So I have a, you know, a string here. It can be considered a sling. And, you know, you do your normal choke scenario, right? Mm -hmm. and so i choked at the bottom of the truss right? yeah and so in tony b world we do a wrap around instead of a choke through the center because what at least the way he explained it to me i've noticed that the top choke grabs the truss and pulls from the top of the truss and it's really loose at the bottom and it doesn't compress, which is what truss is supposed to do. It's supposed to be in compression, right? Well, so not being pulled apart. And so that's the, the ideology or the theory that he has in that concept. Yeah. Just and is why. That, that's an accurate assumption. That's an accurate read on the situation. But, um, and I, I'm trying to find a way to say this without sounding, you know, condescending, but, and I don't want to sound that way at all. Um, you know, they're not paying enough attention. The, the, the way you hang truss, um, there's a lot of folklore out there. There's a lot of hearsay. And in reality, if you talk to any truss manufacturer, uh, as I do, you know, they don't have any real rules Mm -hmm. um, other than don't overload the truss. Um, if you talk to Will Todd at Tomcat, for example, he doesn't care whether you hang the truss in compression as we have here, or whether you top hang the truss. Well, we you, have, we have done a, a seminar in Boston with them. And this was a quite a bit of years ago, about five years ago. And Tony brought that up in the class and he's, 
said exactly that. He's like, I don't care what you do with it as long as you don't break my trust. Right. Was that <laughs> Will? Was that Will? Yeah. 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 I have Man. great. I have I have great fun. I do the Tomcat U class every year. Uh, but he did say that yes, it's plausible. But the way that the trust is made, it if you like you said, if you don't overload it, right. It doesn't matter what you do with it. If you turn it on its side on at a diamond, if you got it tipped straight vertical, as long as it's not, you know, if it's rated for what it's supposed to do, then wrap it however you want. You could sling it, you could do whatever. Right. But my, I think part of the reason I think you compounded on that earlier was we get a lot of stage hands that don't have much experience. So they're not apt to check to make sure that it's tight on the bottom and the way it's wrapped. So it, it, it's right. easier in their head to be like, Hey, just wrap it this way and then be consistent. As long as you're consistent, then I don't have to come back and check your work and it, we can go to town and save so much time because like, I'm sure you've been involved. You go to towns where you're getting like theater kids that are right out of high school and then don't know much. So if you just say, Hey, I want it done this way and do it a thousand times, then you don't have to worry about it. You well, know? yeah. I mean, I did a, when I do, and first of all, full disclosure, you're not going to find me on site that much anymore, right? You know? I haven't seen you since 2003. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I've been, I, I've, I've been on a few, but you know, I mean, that you know, I run on a company. You know, the armory was that job, 2003 <laughs> in the armory. But yeah, oh, back in the day. Yeah. But um, when I'm on a job and I'm running a rig, um, I don't care if there's 30 hoists on the job or 200, mm -hmm. either I as the head rigger or some I and someone that I have um, uh, identified as my assistant, we will check every, every sling, mm -hmm. you know, regardless. Well, I have my guys do that as well. Correct. The reason I do this, I mean, when, when I hang truss and when I teach hanging truss, the, the big thing for me is to make sure, you know, that um, I'm just out of curiosity here. Bear with me for a second. Oh, we still have a fair number of people here. Okay, good. Um, the big thing for me is to develop good habits. Mm -hmm. So I have a default method that I use to hang trust. And if I find myself in a situation where I have to stray from that default method, you know, because the, the, the circumstances require that I do it differently. It causes me to, to stop and think about what I'm doing. It doesn't stop me from doing it. It doesn't say, oh my God, I can't do it this way because I can't do my default. I don't do that. I just, just go, oh, I got to do it this way. Let me make sure that this other way is okay. So this is my default. What this method ensures for me is when I have a single run of trust, you know, it's just a straight run, 35, 40, 50 feet, whatever, going across a room that I have picked up the truss from the bottom. I'm in a panel point, so I'm in the strongest point on the truss. I'm choked on the outside of the truss because that gives me the most stability. Mm -hmm. I'll do a wrap here because I want to control the top cord. I don't want the top cord of the truss when it's a single run. I don't want it rocking back and forth because as it does rock if it starts to roll too far removing the diagonals from the vertical plane and starting to move them closer to the horizontal plane that significantly weakens the truss mm -hmm. and i run the risk of a, a catastrophic failure so this is my default i'm going to do this every time i hang a truss I, and it will be with two slings and this is the way I'm going to do it. I may not need to do it that way, mm -hmm. you know, but that's my default. So that when uh, I'm sorry, I have a second add to that. So the bottom choke at the node point, that's another thing that Tony doesn't like to do because he says it puts compression on the welds of the truss. Yeah, he, 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 you can, you, he can say that. And Tony, I'm sorry, but in this case, you're wrong. You're not doing anything to the truss. If you are do if you're putting enough pressure on the panel point to damage the panel point, oh, I wait. guarantee you, absolutely 100% guarantee you that the truss has failed somewhere else because you overloaded the hell out of it. Out of you. All right. I've had people tell me that they don't want to put 
um, the uh, the choke, the bottom choke, into a panel point because the welding spatter will will damage the sling. Okay. And I point out to them that if if there's welding spatter on the truss, you got bad truss, my friend, and you need to remove the truss. The slings are fine. You got truss from C Factor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, sorry, hey. I worked for them as well. Yeah. Well, I think we all did at one time or another. I never worked well, yeah, for so them. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to override, you know, Tony's. So I'm going to keep doing things the way that he asked yeah. me to do stuff. But yeah. I like to question everything. And then sometimes, and you know, Tony, better than I do, I, you know. Um, but a lot of times when I've questioned him on things, he's just like, because that's the way we do it. And just do okay. it, ask you to do it. And so I'm just curious and. Okay. And there are, are also moments where he's like, he's like with the, the concept of the, the wrapping the truss, he's like, oh, the tension becomes uh, better from picking it up at the bottom. Like he does explain certain things. It depends on his mood and whatnot. But, okay. Um, I want to go to Joel's question here because uh, it's a good one. Um, top cord choke, um, inside, outside. Um, there is a reason for that, Joel. And as, my default is to wrap on the outside because assuming the slings are the are long enough it gives me better control better stability because I'm, I'm on the outside of the truss and i've got two inches on each side so i got four inches more width that i'm dealing with so it it, it, it handles it's, it's more stable that way however if i have slings I got an oddball size piece of truss where they sent me the wrong slings or whatever. And, you know, if when, the, when I will go to wrap the, the, on the outside and instead of the sling going straight, you know, relatively straight up and down or at a reasonable angle like that, this one is, it's coming straight across because it's so short and it comes straight across from the other side and the shackle gets in, you put the shackle into it. Now I'm putting a lot of compression on the top cords of the truss, and I'm side loading my shackle. Um, neither of which are the end of the world necessarily, but they're not good to do. So I will I will wrap the um, the sling on the inside of the of the truss. I will come up on the inside and do my wrap on the top on the inside. I'm losing that two inches on either side of stability but I'm gaining those two inches in length of, um, of sling, you know, going up to the hoist so that I'm cutting down on the compression forces that are running across the top of the truss. Um, uh, sorry, my, well, you, Scott, I'll, so Joel, did that answer your question? Wait a minute, I think I got another one. I mean, wrapping it through the middle of the sling. Um, you know, I think this is an argument that, that people have. Um, I bring it, I think that there is less incidence of uh, creating friction here than wrapping it next to each other, like, you know, in, in a spiral. I think it overwraps itself and creates a force load here rather than down here when you come out side by side, if you will. That's, that's what we do. That's exactly how we do it. Is we go off to the side and do that. We call it the Tony V wrap mm -hmm. instead of the choke. Right. And well, you know, he says is that because the friction is less and the friction becomes more, or like the grip becomes more in the bottom, and you have less friction with doing the choke. That's that's why they make chocolate and vanilla ice cream, my friend. <laughs> you know, <laughs> people are going to have different opinions. Um, nobody has studied this definitively. I mean, it's not like any scientific work is R&D has gone into this. People have their experiences and their opinions based on their experiences. And you know, Tony has his and I'm not going to argue with it at all. I have mine and I like this way better. But you know, at well, the we end, all know, we all know Tony likes his sweets. So <laughs> yeah, at, at the end of the day, like I said, I, I like to sleep at night. And, and you know, um, the reality is, as the trust manufacturers will say, yeah, whatever you want, don't overload my trust. Right, right. Uh, Scott, I think maybe this got answered a minute ago about wrapping through the middle. 
I mean wrapping. Whoop, wait a minute. There we are. I'm sorry, I was reading the wrong chat there. What is the effect of swimming pressure on the diagonals when attached at a small panel point? Well, this is about as small as you're going to get. This is a piece of 12 inch box truss. You're not going to see anything smaller uh, than that. And it has no effect whatsoever if, as I said earlier, if you are affecting it, if, there, if you do damage the diagonal, you know, somewhere else on the truss will have failed already because you've overloaded this thing by such an egregious amount that you know the least of your problems is whether you're messing around with any of the diagonals or not now if you were to try somehow wrap a diagonal and put the choke way up like halfway up the the diagonal and have it be able to stay up there um yeah that's a problem but nobody would ever do that i don't even know how you could physically do it Um, Jeff, Jeff Halpern, do I have a thought about going between the node and the horizontal cross with a sling going completely around the truss? Well, I'm not sure I understand your question, but if, let me, let me try and let me know if I get it right. I think what you're talking about is using one sling that goes all the way around the truss and comes back up to itself and to the hook. And if yep. that's what you're describing, then I'm going to start out by doing a wrap back through the legs here. You, you can't do a choke because you don't get the end of the um, uh, of the sling. The, the ends are up here and you, you're not choking anywhere, but you're wrapping here and you're wrapping here and then going up and doing the same thing with the other, the rest of the sling on the other side. Perfectly, perfectly uh, acceptable. Once again, you know, I'm choking here. I'm sorry, I'm wrapping here with that one sling. I don't want the sling sliding up and down along the truss. I don't want the, the sling, I don't want the truss sliding if the truss gets out of level. You know, if they, you know, someone screws up and they get one end of the truss higher than the other. I don't want the, the end of the truss sliding out of the sling. Um, so I'm going to do a wrap here and my default is going to be to do a, a wrap up here so that I can control the top cords of the truss better. Hopefully that answers your question, Jeff. If not, let me know. <sighs> Anybody else? Okay, well, I think if that does it, I think that um, we have uh, potentially did I, I have a quick question, Bill. Oh, you sure. On the bag hooks, sometimes on the bag hooks, I've seen them like damaged the gates for the tiny little bag hooks. Right. And someone just comes along. I point them all out, all the broken ones or the ones that are all whacked. And right. I point them out to my head rigger and he just bends them back. And he's like, so what? And he's just like gravity, the bag. And I'm like, okay. Well, agree. I mean, I, I understand there's, there's something to be said on both sides. You can, you can be, you, you can get, you know, a little over concerned and, and, you know, you may, there's no easy way to say this. Sometimes you're okay. It depends on how badly that, that hook is damaged. I will not let a hook that has a, you know, you know, overhead suspension system. If that hook does not have a safety latch that is functioning, even if it's loose, you know, or bent up a little bit, you know, but if it's still functioning, okay. Um, but if it's not functioning, if it's not engaging the hook, or if it's um, broken off, it's not there anymore, you can't use it. At the end of the, the, the bottom line here is that you can't guarantee that something is not going to, to hit that hook. You know, you got a show where you got trusses right next to each other and a couple of them move all during the show. I mean, we've all been on shows like that. And, you know, if a truss comes up and grabs um, a bag or grabs a hook and snaps it off, you know, now you don't get any reaction time because the damage was created, the catastrophic situation was created at the beginning of the problem rather than halfway through or at the end of the problem, you know? And if you pick up a, a bag 
you're probably going to know if somebody's paying attention and you get to stop before the hook gets ripped out. But And what do you think about someone jerry-rigging that just for like make a trick line and and uh, mouse it off or zip tie it or if someone gonna, just like temporarily not, fixes it? I'm not going to say I've never done it, mm -hmm. but I've done it in situations where I've examined the risk. If I've got a truss running across the room, it's going to sit there and there's nothing near it. I mean, there's nothing moving. It's just going to sit there for the show. You know, I'll put a zip tie. I'll put tie line on it. I'll put gaff tape on it if I have to. But I'm going to do something, right, to make sure that the hook doesn't come undone. You know, if it's, as I described earlier, if it's a situation where there's a lot of stuff going on and there's movement during the show, no, I'm not going to do zip ties or any of that you know, stop gap stuff, I'm going to change the bag, you know, you're going to have more bags on the job site. I mean, not every bag is on a hoist that's moving during the show. It'll take a couple extra minutes to find that bag and swap them out. But it's a whole lot better than sweeping up uh, chain and body parts up off the floor, you know. And some of the two ton bags, they have like a wooden a wooden um, pad inside and some are sewed in and built in and then some have them where you actually see the physical wooden block in there so I usually fill them fill around and I, I I usually hit all the bags like shake them out and hit them right and it's all about how you load the chain into the bag yeah the right way as well yeah. so Thank I you. always just go around shaking bags or hidden bags just to let the chain settle as well a good piece of advice I'm glad you brought it up I wish we had I talked about it earlier but you're right you will see you know wooden pads in the bottom of the two-ton bags and if they're not seated properly you run the risk as you're bringing the rig down and the chain's going out of the bag of pulling that block of wood out you know a block of wood falling from 40 or 50 feet is going to do some damage you know and you don't want that to happen okay Let's see what else we got here sure good to see you happy new year yeah, and we use nine inch, nine foot swings and wrap all four cords. Okay, that's a good idea, Jeff. Um, Joe, I think we answered your question about wrapping top and bottom, did we? Or do I need to get into that again? The quick answer is I, my default is to, to choke the bottom and wrap the top cord to put the truss into compression. Um, manufacturers will tell you they don't really care as long as you don't overload the truss. Um, you know, we don't always know when we're overloading a truss. So I want it to be as strong as possible. I've been told when using the GT truss that they prefer you uh, attach to the top cord and not the bottom cord. That's their preference. Uh, who, when you whose truss is this? Uh, Tyler GT. Okay, and they have every right to say that. They know their truss. They made their truss, and if they prefer that you attach to the top cord, that's what you do. And I think that that premise came about even in earlier versions of truss that have open bottoms with no horizontal connecting members. The uh, spacer truss, I think, was another one that had a similar scenario where if you attach to the bottom and it's not directly under the top cord, they were afraid it was going to pull open. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I haven't used truss with a, with a completely open bottom in longer than I can remember. Um, but you're absolutely 100% correct. If there are no horizontal spreader members or diagonals or anything, connecting the bottom cords other than the end the end plates uh, I would not hang from that bottom cord because you, you do run the risk of just pulling it right open there's nothing holding it back it's not compression you're worried about you're worrying about it splaying out and it, it won't take much thanks good question all right it's pushing four. Um, I'm good. If, if you guys are good, um, thank you.
And um, if you have any other questions, if something you know comes you know, comes to mind later on, send me an email. Mahala, Rick. Take care of yourself. Enjoy. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Bye. And enjoy Bye. the sunshine. <laughs> Thanks, right. Bill. Thanks, Thanks Thank Bill. I I am going to um, close this out, which means that I will unceremoniously dump us all right out of Thanks, the uh, out of the meeting. <laughs> Have a good. All right. Take care now. Stay safe.